Hello and welcome to INSS 13th Annual Conference. I'm Michal Chatuel, Research Fellow at INSS. And with me here in the studio is Dr. Sharon Nazarian, who is a Senior Vice President of International Affairs at ADL. And she heads ADL's global work, uh, Fighting Anti-Semitism and Racial Hatred, and ADL's Israel Office. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having me. So I was um, very interested in uh, what you had to say in your panel. We were speaking on the heels of your panel. Uh, maybe I should say that to our viewers. And one of the things that's very interesting for me to understand, and I'm sure for our Israeli viewers who are not very much uh, attuned to anti-Semitism, because obviously here in Israel we don't witness, we don't encounter anti-Semitism, is if you can give us a bit of a perspective from your global work is there a difference in anti-Semitism in the way it's manifested in different regions in the world? Uh, absolutely it is. And I think it's good to start by saying today no government or no official leader will ever say that we welcome anti-Semitism. So everybody's against anti-Semitism, of course. Uh, the difference that you see as you travel around the world is that in Europe today, and we have polling data that shows this, um, we have incidence data of what are the kinds of incidents that are taking place. Um, and so the difference starting in Europe, you see that in, in Western Europe, the biggest physical threat to Jews in Western communities, like in France, um, like in Germany, is a physical threat really still assaulted by Islamic extre extremism. Whereas in Eastern Europe today, um, the actual threat is coming more from right-wing, classic uh, anti-Semitism. And the threat is, is less than physical, but it's more the kinds of experiences you have, what you read online, the kinds of rhetoric the government uses. They use language like globalist. They use language like blaming George Soros for come, you know, bringing hundreds of uh, thousands of Muslim uh, refugees into their country in order to uh, basically cleanse their Judeo-Christian um, uh, values. So they, they use rhetoric by their leaders in Eastern Europe that is, can be construed as anti-Semitic, but is not trying to be blatantly one. In Latin America, uh, what we see is really Israel is at the forefront of the anti-Semitic face of um, anti-Semitism. So the Jewish communities of Chile, for example, where there is a very large Palestinian com uh, community, around 250,000, most of their interaction with anti-Semitism comes in the face of the Palestinian Chilean community attacking the Jewish community, holding them responsible for Israeli policies they don't agree with. So Latin America is really more, there is classic anti-Semitism, but today it's really an assault on Israel and holding the Jewish community responsible. And the Middle East, you know, it's very much very old classic types of anti-Semitism, the kind of hate you see in their textbooks that they're teaching against Jews, but also against other religions, Christians, against LGBT. So in the Arab world, especially in the Gulf, and what we see through their media, the state-run media, is still very classic anti-Semitic tropes that are used commonly and accepted. Wow, so after this graphic description, my next natural question would be, as a Jew living in, you live in the United States, but how, how do you encounter anti-Semitism? And do you in any way uh, feel that you need to hide your uh, Jewishness, if it's to wear your Magen David inside or not to wear a Magen David at all? Or how do you deal with this? Do you feel threatened at all? I think uh, it's important to look at what happened the last couple of months of 2019, especially in New York and New Jersey. The kinds of anti-Semitic incidents and assaults that took place was directed toward the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredi uh, pop populations of those cities. Why? Because they look visibly Jewish. So that's where we are today in America. And we're seeing in communities where Jews that are visibly Jewish isolate themselves, are seen as kind of more isolating, not integrating with the broader communities they live in. They're really getting the bulk of the uh, kind of anti-Semitic attacks on them. As an American Jew, would I not wear a Magen David? No, I absolutely would. I live in Los Angeles. I feel very safe. But for the first time in American Jewish history in, in decades, these questions are even being asked. The fact that you're asking me that question is a change, reflects the, t the times that now we are facing where Jews are questioning when they go to the synagogue, they check if there's a security guard at the door. We never had that before. When parents ch send their children to Jewish day school, they ask the school authority, is there security for my children? 
So these are new questions for American Jews that now has become a part of our daily life, and it's not a good trend. We're, this is not a good sign. So this is interesting because you're describing one aspect of things that maybe have changed, but I'd want to ask you maybe to elaborate on are there other things that have changed? One of the things that you mentioned in the, in the uh, panel is that what you've seen in polling is that there isn't a spike in opinions about anti-Semitism, but in the manifestations that anti-Semites feel emboldened. What other trends are you seeing regarding anti-Semitism? So what we're seeing is really the coming together of anti-Semitic views um, and extremist ideology. So one of the things ADL does and spends a lot of time monitoring is extremist groups in the US and around the world. So let's take white supremacists, for example. We've seen that the main multiple physical attacks on Jewish communities from Pittsburgh to Poway were perpetrated by lone wolves who held extreme anti-Semitic white supremacist ideas, right? And they inspired one another. They referenced each other's manifestos, even though they didn't join or were not part of a global network of white supremacists, they were lone wolves. We see that they are radicalized and they're emboldened by language that they're seeing other white supremacists use. Because of technology and social networks? Absolutely, absolutely. So we actually released a report in 2019 for the first time. It was a joint ADL report with five European uh, extremist organizations that showed that global um, uh, white supremacist organizations are not only mimicking one another, not only copying, not only collaborating, but are inspired by one another. And we showed exact evidence that not only they're using the same language, using the same techniques, and the same ideology runs and connects them globally. So what I have to tell you is new today is that these are now global phenomena. These are not ideologies that are bound by borders and nationalities anymore. What happened in Christchurch, what happened in Poway, these are all part of a connected dot now of extremist groups that have anti-Semitic, but at the same time anti-refugee, anti-all other groups, ideologies, and therefore ADL focuses a lot on extremist ideology. That is something that we feel that's what we have to be putting our eyes on because they're the ones acting out. They're the ones that are doing the incidents, not the majority of the populations of America or other places. Okay, so in light of this very vivid, I think, comprehensive picture that you've uh, outlined about uh, and relating to anti-Semitism, my final question could be a bit of a tricky one, but I'll ask it anyway. What do you think, as uh, a not, someone who is not, not, not a, an immediate part of the state of Israel, you're not an Israeli citizen, what does the Israeli state need to do in light of, of anti-Semitism outside the state. What is Israel's role? It's a very tricky role. It is a tricky role, and I think it's important for Israel not to feel that this is the sole responsibility of Israel to solve. This is, as I said in the panel, issue of problem of anti-Semitism is not a problem of the Jewish people around the world, nor is it a problem of Israel. It is the problem of the governments to protect their own Jewish citizens. They cannot be let go of the responsibility that they hold vis-a-vis -vis their own citizens. So that's number one. Number two, there are some tools that we have now that we all as advocates, whether it's the government of Israel, whether it's NGOs like us, have to hold governments up to. So we have now the IRA definition. It's a working definition, it's not legally binding, but what's very important and powerful about it is the examples under the definition, which says when you cross these lines, this is anti-Semitism. For decades, governments would say, well, we don't really know what's anti-Semitism. We don't even know what it is. How do we define it? Now we have a definition. And it's up to them to make sure that this definition is adopted not just by their government and in their parliaments, but at every level of society, in their police force, in their prosecutor's office, in the judges, in schools and other places. So it, that's a very important tool that Israel, as part of its advocacy, we have all the embassies around the world, that should be a point that they should be advocating for. Secondly, there are real um, advocacy in terms of getting governments to have special appointed envoys and commissioners on anti-Semitism. I talked about Germany doing that now. Every European country needs to have, in every part of their lives, in part of their government, specific people appointed just to look at issues through the lens of anti-Semitism. As do you in the United States? Absolutely. So we have the special envoy in the, in the foreign ministry, in the Secretary of State's office. But at, at, in Europe, even further than that, even at the bottom level, at the state level, 
in a hate, looking at hate crime legislation and making sure that when there is a hate crime, there's someone who understands what is anti-Semitic and what is not. So there are tools that Israel has at its disposal as part of its diplomacy, as part of its negotiation with governments. They should be a talking point that it's regularly used. So Israel can advocate for these measures with foreign states. Absolutely. Okay, we're out of time. I'm being signaled. Thank you very much for joining us, Sharon. Thank you for having me.